Today we're talking about the reforms under President Johnson. Um, so the major thing here is with our even with our key terms, it's all pretty self-explanatory. So we'll just go ahead and get into it, and I'll begin explaining when the timer hits zero. When we talk about President Johnson, and this is the second President Johnson, the first one, Andrew Johnson, was back in uh, during, right after the Civil War, took over after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. This President Johnson is President Lyndon Johnson, and he takes over after President Kennedy is assassinated. It is an odd coincidence. Um, but his background, which is important because he had, he was one of the more experienced congressional members who's ever taken the office of the president. So he served in the House of Representatives. He was also a senator from the state of Texas. He was a Democrat from Texas, which is a rarity nowadays, but back then that was not so uncommon. Um, he served as the Senate Majority Leader, so he knew how to get things done. And because of his pedigree, so to speak, he thought that in 1960 he was going to be the Democrat nominee for president, but he loses out to Kennedy and then decides, well, uh, you know, I'll become Kennedy's vice president. This was mainly to pull in Southern votes for Kennedy. And with as tight of an election that it was, uh, you can pretty much credit Senator Lyndon Johnson with um, getting Kennedy the win for president. So anytime a vice president takes over for a president after, uh, after a death of a president, it's sort of assumed that that person is going to continue on that legacy. Now with President Johnson, he also had the added um, sort of wrinkle there of he was also now thrust into running for president because there was, uh, President Kennedy was assassinated while campaigning for president. So. Johnson's got two things to do. He's got to finish out the presidential campaign and he's got to finish out the term for John F. Kennedy. Um, so this is where his congressional skills come into play. And he's able to make sure that he gets Congress to back the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act to uh, finish what Kennedy was starting with civil rights. Um, on top of that, he continues to support NASA to the point where uh, he moves NASA literally out to Texas and out to uh, the Houston area. And uh, that's why the Space Center out there is the Johnson Space Center. Um, and, but he supports them through the Gemini program, 
and then the Apollo program, which is the one that eventually puts uh, a man on the moon. Um, and then the last thing that's kind of Kennedy-esque is that he then turns to, uh, to see about problems, uh, fixing the problems that he sees in American society. And that's what leads him to his war on poverty. So when he's elected president in 1964, he's now on his own. He no longer has to cater to Kennedy's legacy. So, but he's going to try and carve out the, uh, a niche for himself among presidents. And the war on poverty is his first step into this because he sees poverty as being the biggest threat. Poverty is a problem not just for white Americans, but also for African Americans and other Americans of color. And this is one of the main drivers as he sees it. So he wants to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to get education, whether that's through traditional schooling or through job skills training. Um, and this is, they start an organization called like Jobs Corps, and it makes sure that everybody who wants to work can get the skills that they need to get a good paying job. Um, and we'll continue to talk on this slide. Now, what we end up talking about Johnson uh, with in terms of his highlight is what is called the Great Society. Many of these programs that we still benefit from today. But again, once he is into the office of president and he's no, and hadn't inherited the office from President Kennedy, he can now start acting um, on a program to kind of elevate his stature in terms of the history of presidents. Now, you, the key thing to always remember about President Johnson is that everything he did was, was calculated. He never did anything that was just sort of random or something, um, something without it having a positive net um, consequence for himself or for the Democrats. So, the ideas behind the Great Society are to, uh, are to get the majority of Americans to look at the Democrats as being the people who helped them out um, and that they continue to vote Democrat. Because what's starting to happen in the 1960s is the political landscape starting to change in the United States, which we'll get to when we, in a couple of chapters when we start talking about uh, Richard Nixon. But Johnson's trying to lock that down so the Democrats will stay in power for the foreseeable future. So his programs are aimed at those that are impoverished, the, uh, those that are affected by uh, 
by denial of civil rights. Um, and so he starts kind of checking things off his list. So he's working on civil rights. His key thing was the Voting Rights Act, making sure that uh, everyone's right to vote was protected, particularly those people of color and African Americans in the United States who were being denied the right to vote. He had Congress create programs called Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare, which is health care uh, healthcare assistance for the el elderly, and Medicaid, which is health care assistance for the poor. Um, he had the federal government invest a lot of money into public education, you know, going all the way down to public grade schools, to high schools, to public universities, so that they could offer job skills, they could offer degrees in wide varieties of fields so that it, it would be affordable for people to go to a public university and be able to get the training that they needed to be successful. Um, he also had environmental programs where he was trying to remove harmful chemicals from the environment. Many of those have been there because of emissions from cars. There was a lot of lead in our atmosphere. People were breathing that in as unhealthy. You had uh, chemicals that were in fertilizers that were starting to get into the water table and people drinking them and getting cancers and other diseases that they shouldn't have been. So he does step up. It, one of the first presidents to really start trying to correct problems that human beings were causing on the environment. And then he also eased restrictions on immigrants, pri primarily, again, immigrants of color uh, from the Central, Central and South America began coming in and actually adding to the American economy. And again, all of this is to lock those people in as voters so that they'll continue to vote Democrat. And typically when a president gets like this, like even when we talk about FDR back during the Great Depression, they're met with resistance. Johnson was able to work Congress over and make sure that there was little resistance there. And what FDR ran into, which was a Supreme Court that started calling his programs unconstitutional, Johnson didn't run into that because he had Judge Earl Warren, who was not appointed by President Johnson, but was appointed, I uh, believe, by President Eisenhower. And um, the Warren Court is a very progressive court, meaning that they they are for protecting individual liberties and rights, and they make a ton of decisions. They were part of the Brown versus Board. They uh, protect, they make rulings on freedom of speech. By the time the court's over, they're gonna have ruled on, uh, on a woman's right to choose, so on and so forth. And in this case, what they don't do is they don't strike down a lot of President Johnson's policies. What is going to happen, though, over the long term is a lot of these policies that we don't talk about right now that were originally passed were done away with as uh, American politicians became more and more conservative and were wanting to cut costs. And we'll leave it there for today, and we'll come back to President Johnson later.